hey, it's Fat Albert. Well, actually, my real name is Keenan Thompson, but I play Fat Albert in the live action film based on Bill Cosby's hit show. My buddies and I love adventure, but we also love a good challenge. That's why we love the NASA sci-fi. If you want an adventure in math, science, and technology, check in on the Treehouse Detectives hot on the trail with their latest case on this exciting episode of the NASA sci-fi. to look for the answers to the following questions. Why is it important to classify animals? Which phylum of invertebrates is most common? What are the five classes of vertebrates? When you see this icon, the answer is near. ride. Riding across the water at top speeds, checking out nature, and the wildlife was amazing. Right, amazing. Come on, Catherine. That has to rank up there as one of the coolest. You're right. It was cool, but but what? I've been thinking. Remember when we were out on the boat and we stopped to examine some of the plant life under the water? Well, I turned around to see this bird fall from the sky. I followed it down only to see another bird flailing around in the water obviously hurt. I mentioned it to our guide, and he said that on a preserve, they don't usually rescue or help animals under stress from natural causes. There are no traps or anything there, so the bird probably had been attacked by a predator, but it gotten away. They don't interfere. I don't know. It just seems like there's something that we can do to help. Well, we are talking about nature. I'm not sure we can help every animal. True, but I wonder what we can do. Kelly might be able to help. She's the expert on nature and animals. She probably doesn't have time. I think she's working on some kind of project. I have an idea, but it's going to require everyone's help and Jacob's backyard. Jacob might be hard to convince. I don't know. Beneath his harsh exterior lies a truly compassionate nature lover. Really? <laughs> OK, so I'm exaggerating, but I'm sure I'll help. Let's contact the others. I don't know how you expect me to help you with the wildlife badge research with all this prime real estate just waiting to be developed. Tony, if we build houses everywhere there are forests, there won't be any wildlife. Of course. You're right. By the way, how's the research coming along? I've taken some pictures of our state bird, and I've identified some poisonous plants. But I still have a lot of work to do. Well, I hope you have some extra time on your hands. What's up? I just got an email from Catherine. She said she saw an injured animal in the Everglades, and she and Bianca want to create their own backyard habitat. Sounds cool. Whose backyard? They've talked to Jacob, and he's agreed to use his backyard. I think he's hoping he doesn't have to cut the grass anymore. <laughs> At least he's doing what he can to help. Good point. But the question is, what can we do? They're sure in Florida and don't know where to begin. I'm not sure, but maybe my research for my wildlife badge can help them. Great idea. Let's start with the problem board. OK, what do we know? We know that Catherine saw an injured animal in distress. And of course we know that animals are a part of the animal kingdom. 
And we also know that there are many different types of animals. So what do we need to know? I think we need to start with the basics. If we're going to make a habitat for animals, we should learn how to classify and identify them. And which ones we need to protect. So where should we go? Didn't you go on a camping trip to Bush Gardens with your Girl Scout troop? Right. They take care of some amazing animals there. I'm sure they'll help us. I'll email my troop leader. Excellent idea. And don't forget, we have to email Dr. D, Bianca and Catherine, and download a Get Up and Go sheet. You can get your own Get Up and Go sheet at the NASA Sci Files website. It may take a lot of hard work, but it's good to help. I'm here at Bush Gardens in Williamsburg, Virginia, to talk with their zoological manager, Mr. Rob Yorty. He actually works with wolves here at the park, so it should be very exciting. The wolves are very fascinating creatures, but remember, no cameras, backpacks, and also don't look them in the eye so we won't distract them. No problem. They look like dogs. Well, that's because they're in the same phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, class mammalia, order carnivora, and family canidae as dogs are. Uh, could you repeat that? <laughs> well, actually, in your email, you requested information on how to classify animals, and that is the classification for wolves. But maybe we should start at the beginning. That sounds like a good idea. We know that there are two main kingdoms, plants and animals, but we need to learn more about how animals are classified. Just like for plants, scientists use a classification system for animals. The animal kingdom is divided into smaller groups. The largest group within a kingdom is a phylum. Phyla are divided into classes. Classes are divided into smaller and smaller groups. The smallest group is the species. Why is it important to classify animals? By classifying animals, we can give each organism a unique, scientifically accepted name, which avoids confusion. Why can't you just call a dog a dog? Well, an animal's common name can vary within languages, also within regions, even in the same country. Here in the U.S., the mountain lion is also called the panther, the cougar, or the puma. It's known as a cat of many names. So how do animals get their names? Well, scientists look at specific characteristics of each organism to divide them into groups. The animal kingdom is divided into two specific groups, vertebrates and invertebrates. How are they different? Vertebrates are animals with a backbone or a spinal column. Invertebrates are not. I have a backbone, I must be a vertebrate. Yes, you are. About 5% of animals are vertebrates and are categorized into classes according to their traits. Vertebrates include fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Wow, only 5%? Does that mean the other 95% are invertebrates? That's correct. The invertebrate phyla consists of many different species of worms, insects, sponges, and even microscopic organisms. If I were to find an animal in my backyard that I didn't recognize, how could I identify it? Well, one way that scientists use to identify an animal is through the use of a dichotomous key. Dichotomous key? I'm not sure I understand. Dichotomous means separated into two parts. Dichotomous key is a method used to identify an object by giving a specific set of choices all the way down to the object's name, or in this case, an animal. How does it work? You start out with two characteristics. After choosing the first characteristic, you are given two more to choose from. You keep making choices until you classify the animal. If you're looking at an animal, the first set of characteristics would be backbone or no backbone. And if it has a backbone, then you would keep looking at other characteristics to narrow it down. Exactly. Like the gray wolf, you would start out with backbone or no backbone. You would choose backbone. The next set of choices would be fur or feathers. You would choose fur. Go down to the next set would be long canine teeth or short canine teeth. You would choose long canine teeth and eventually get down to the gray wolf classification. They're really beautiful. The gray wolf used to be endangered in the United States due to overhunting and the loss of habitat, but through conservation efforts, it is now considered threatened. It is the largest of the canid species and has the largest range of any land mammal with the exception of humans. They are pack hunters and usually feed on mammals larger than themselves, including caribou, elk, and deer. They also have a very distinctive howl. You're lucky to have such cool animals here at the park. We're thrilled, and Bush Gardens Williamsburg is committed to the conservation of all animals. We have lots of different animals in our park to help teach our guests about their habitats, behaviors, the animal status in the wild, and what needs to be done to help the environment. Seeing an animal up close and personal really does make a difference. Just wait till you see the show. Kaylee, what a cool vessel. Yes, it is. 
It's like the kind used to collect bioluminescent organisms. You sure can learn a lot about organisms in this glowing exhibit. <laughs> Very funny, Dr. D. I was surprised to learn that organisms can give off light by mixing chemicals in their own body, just like mixing chemicals in this glow stick. Right, and organisms that make themselves glow are called bioluminescent. Did you know that 90% of mid-ocean organisms are bioluminescent? They use their light to blind their predators, attract prey, and find a mate. Wow, you really know your stuff. In the ocean, you'll find jellyfish, sea cucumbers, shrimp, squid, and octopus that glow. And on land, you'll find fireflies, glowworms, snails, and click beetles. Hmm. So far, you've mentioned only invertebrate animals. Right. We learned that the animal kingdom is divided into vertebrates and invertebrates. Mr. Yordi at Bush Gardens told us that most of the animals are invertebrates. Very good. The animal kingdom has over 30 major groups or phyla. One of these includes all of the vertebrates, and there are eight others that include a majority of the invertebrates. Do you know which of the invertebrates are the most common? I'm pretty sure insects are the most common. Insects, including fireflies, are part of the phylum known as arthropoda. There are more than a million arthropod species, and most of them are insects. Does arthropoda also include crabs and spiders? Yes, it does, along with bioluminescent shrimp. Are snails arthropods? No. Arthropods have a hardened exoskeleton, which you might confuse with a snail's shell. Arthropods also have jointed appendages, like wings, legs, or antennas. So snails must be grouped with other shelled animals, like clams. Very good. Clams, mussels, and snails, along with octopus and squid, are all part of mollusca. Mollusks are soft-bodied. In fact, mollusca comes from the Latin word for soft. Jellyfish are soft. Are they also part of mollusca? Unfortunately, classification is a little more complicated than just hard and soft. Jellyfish, along with corals, are part of Nidaria. These animals have tentacles and stinging cells. Nidaria? That's strange to say. How about Nematoda? That sounds like it has to do with the frog. Nematoda actually refers to roundworms, which have a tube-like body. Earthworms are also tube-like, but they belong to the phylum Annelida, which are segmented animals. Worms show some complicated names. Just wait, there's more. Platyhelminthia, which is Latin for flatworm, are the simplest animals that have organ systems. And I thought sea cucumber was a strange name. Oh, sea cucumbers are from the Echinodermata phylum, along with sand dollars and starfish. These spiny skin animals have suction cup feet. The next phylum is very simple. Finally, a simple name. No, the name is not simple, but the animals are. Sponges are part of the peripheral phylum. These primitive animals have no symmetry, tissues, or organs. Wow, classifying animals is harder than I thought. I hope we fare better with our backyard habitat. Have you heard from the others? Bianca and Catherine are researching vertebrates. They made a contact at NASA Kennedy Space Center, so they should have some excellent data. True. I'm going out of town, but if I can help, send me an email. Catherine and I are meeting with Ms. Rebecca Smith, a wildlife ecologist at NASA Kennedy Space Center. Part of her job is to monitor and minimize the effects of the space program on the environment, habitats, and wildlife. Plus, she knows all about vertebrates. Maybe we'll get to see some other than ourselves. Reach around and touch the middle of your back. What do you feel? I feel my backbone. Exactly. All vertebrates have an endoskeleton, which is an internal skeleton with a backbone. They have small bones called vertebrae. They typically consist of a bony arch that encloses a hole for the spinal cord and have stubby projections that connect with adjacent bones. Why do animals, I mean vertebrates, need an endoskeleton? It supports and protects the internal organs of the body and also provides a place for muscles to attach. The vertebrae protect the nerve or spinal cord and because it is in many pieces, it allows an animal to bend. So if an animal has a backbone, you know it belongs to the phylum vertebrata. But how can you determine which class it belongs to? You have to look at other characteristics or attributes. A key difference among vertebrates is how they regulate body temperature. What do you mean? The frog and the snake are both cold-blooded animals called ectotherms. They don't have an internal ability to control their body temperature. They rely on heat from the environment to keep them at a temperature for life processes. So when it's cold, their body processes slow down, and when it's warm, they speed up. What about warm-blooded animals? They're called endotherms. Their bodies can regulate heat, so they maintain a constant body temperature, even if the temperature changes around them. Shivering, panting, and sweating are some of the ways that endotherms can control their body temperature. Which classes of vertebrates are warm-blooded, and which are cold-blooded? There are five classes of vertebrates. 
fish, amphibians, and reptiles are cold-blooded. Birds and mammals are warm-blooded. So once you know if they are warm-blooded or cold-blooded, what other characteristics can you use to determine an animal's class? Each class is very different. For example, fish have fins, gills, and most have scales that cover and protect their body. They live in a variety of aquatic habitats from saltwater to freshwater. So all fish aren't the same? No, there are three types. Jawless fish, cartilage fish, and bony fish. Amphibians live in water. How are they different from fish? Unlike fish, most amphibians only spend part of their lives in the water and the rest of their lives on land. There are three types of amphibians, frogs and toads, newts and salamanders, and sicilians. Why do they spend time on land and in water? Amphibians need the water to lay their eggs. The young are also aquatic for a time before they go through metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is the process that occurs when an animal changes form as it develops into an adult. That's correct. For example, a frog develops from an egg to a tadpole and then to an adult. What about reptiles? Snakes are reptiles. You want to see a corn snake? Sure. sure. Come on. Some reptiles, such as water snakes and sea turtles, live most of their lives in the water. But reptiles are primarily crocodilians, turtles, lizards, and snakes that can live on land from birth to death without returning to the water to reproduce. This is a corn snake. Most snakes in the U.S. are not poisonous and are actually beneficial to us because they occupy an important ecological niche, such as keeping the rodent population under control. She's cool. What about birds? Birds are unique because they lay hard-shelled eggs, they have beaks, wings, and feathers, and lightweight, hollow bones that make it easier to fly. So that leaves us mammals. That's correct. Mammals have hair, give live birth, and feed milk to their young. There are three different types of mammals, the egg-laying mammals, the pouched mammals, or marsupials, and the placental mammals, which are the largest group. Don't mammals live in a variety of different habitats? Animals such as whales and dolphins live in the ocean, sloths live in the trees, bats fly around, and moles live underground. Wow, I never knew animals were so diverse. It must be fun to study animals every day. And challenging. For example, whenever a new building needs to be built or a pipeline needs to be laid, we go to the area and survey the site to see what animals will be affected. Whenever possible, we move the animals out of harm's way, and we work closely with project managers to reduce or eliminate the impacts. Thanks, Ms. Smith. Now we need to research what animals need. Mr. Mario Moda, a colleague of mine, might be able to help you. Great. Yeah. Protecting animals may be more difficult than we thought. I know Kaylee and the other treehouse detectives are working hard, but we still have a lot to do.